Well, it's the way things have been going. It is only a matter of time till you'll be carrying my chest. Lion Emprag, hello? Hey, uh, here are your disclaimers, and I am sorry for my accent. Day one. She meets you at the bus station of a nearby hub town. If you can even call the remote gas station parking lot where you got dropped off a bus station. Or at least you guess she is here to meet you. Other than a gas station attendant, there doesn't seem to be a single other soul in sight. Hi, hon. I'm Doris. Doris Pryor. Just want to check if I have the right person. You are? My name. It's Lion. Lion. Is that right? Yes. I'd just like to be sure I know exactly what's going on. Come on in, Lion. It'll be great to have you join our little community. Her voice is warm and soft. Her features in general have a softness about them that puts you at ease. She motions towards the beat-up old car behind her, which groans when you open the side door, and squeaks when you sit down in the passenger seat. Once you're secure in the seatbelt, she starts the car, and you set off for the last leg of your journey together. The work's hard, but you won't be the only one there. You got Joseph there. It's his family's farm. Plus another one like you, someone in from the city. I don't quite recall their name. You found a job listing online for manual labor in a small community in the north, mostly helping out on their local farm. The location on the listing was more remote than ideal, but the price was right, plus with room and board offered. You didn't really have much of a choice. It's not like you have anything much waiting for you back in the city. Or anyone for the matter. Who knows, you think? Maybe this is the chance to settle down some roots. A place to grow. Still, as you continue to drive past an unchanging landscape of trees, and you watch the bars on your cell phone gradually go down, you can't help but feel a deep sense of apprehension. Finally, after maybe an hour or so, you start to see spatterings of something like civilization yet again. Old houses, their windows boarded up, begin to pass you by. The pavement of the street is cracked in places like dry dirt, bits of tree roots and weeds clawing their way out of the fractures. There's a gas station convenience store. My brother works there. He's a bit sickly, so best to leave him alone. She points to a lonesome building with a few pumps out front, slowing down to a roll as you pass by. Although you squint, you still aren't able to see any signs of movement from the store window. You also know that she doesn't give the same treatment to any other buildings on your drive through the town. A short distance away, you finally see another car, or truck rather, Pull into the driveway of a bungalow. The first sign of another human you've seen thus far. An impressively tall woman gets out of the truck and moves towards to truck bed. She hoists something out of the back and onto her shoulders. Her long blonde hair looks wild, even tied up in a ponytail, with bits of leaves and twigs sticking out of it. As the car inches closer, you see the thing she is now easily carrying is the carcass of a deer. The sound of the car must have caught her attention because the woman turns to face you. Her face breaks out into a wide grin, and she waves at you enthusiastically, her gloved hand still wet from the slick blood of the dead animal. That's Lori, our local hunter. I imagine folks down south like you find it inhumane. But in places like this, you do need to hunt to survive. A rough voice carries through the window of the car as you pass by. Now, what you got there, Doris? She speaks in that round of way that marks the north, her accent notably more heavy than Doris's. Doris stalls the car for a moment to make small talk. New farmhand, here to help Joseph out. The hunter squats down slightly to get a better look at you. They are still on her shoulder and now directly in front of your face. Her eyes are large as she peers into the car, smiling. Although she is facing you, her eyes are so dark, you can't tell whether or not she's looking at you directly. Also, why can't we see Lori? I mean, I'm pretty sure that there are some people out there who really want to see Lori. Like, god damn, like, Lori seems like the sort of person that I would love to get to know a little better. Like, holy frick. Oh, yeah, eh? Well, me? I was just out in the tree stands for almost 12 hours today. I was. My legs, my legs were getting numb, and I had to piss a couple of times. I must start about climbing down. But I thought to myself, well, the deer don't care where I piss, and I... Anyway, we'll be going now. Lots to get done today. 
Dorsey's speech is a little clipped, lacking the warmth she has when talking to you. She starts the engine again, leaving Lori behind, leaving yet again in the reflection of the back-facing mirror. Sorry about that. Lori's not a bad sort. She has a habit of talking your ear off. You only pass a few more houses before the car slows to its final halt. This is it. Come on out, hon. You follow her up the driveway to the farmhouse, a quaint little house with a white porch. You wait beside Doris as she raps on the door. Joseph! Got that extra hand for you. Be polite and say hello. There are a few moments of silence before Doris begins again. Her voice shrill this time as her rapping evolving to pounding against the wooden door. Joseph! I know you can hear me. Come on right here this instant. I'm coming. You hear a muffled slurring voice from behind the door, followed by the jangling of a chain and the latch unlocking. The smell of dry spit and alcohol wafts through the door when Joseph steps out. God, why are you looking like that? I mean, kind of cute, but goddamn, clean up after yourself. He looks to have been once boyish, good looking at a time, but the bags under his eyes and the obvious inebriation have stripped him of the charm. You, what do you want? I want you to say hello to the new farmhand who just came in from down south. Should make the last bits of harvest a bit easier on you. Lion, this is Joseph. You'll be working with him for the next few days. The new farmhand. Now, without the door to block the sound, you can recognize the very slight sing-song staccato with a local French accent. He turns to look at you, but when your eyes meet his unfocused, hazel eyes, he suddenly startles, his pale face flushing and gaze becoming sharp. You introduce yourself with some hesitation. Lion. Lion. That's not right. He mutters your name to himself quickly, as his eyes bore into you. It will be nice to have you here. Hey! What's your that expression, my dude? Alright then, I'll show you where you'll be staying next. She leads you to a nearby house. You don't look back, but you still feel Joseph's gaze burning into you as you follow Doris across the road. She sighs as you walk away. He's going through a bit of a rough patch right now, but... He did used to be a good man. Anyway, here are your keys. A house is just over that way if you need me. You're welcome to stop by any time. She points at a house not too far away, directly in front of the farmhouse where Jody lives. The house next to yours is the other farmhand. They mostly keep to themselves, so I don't know if you'll be seeing them outside of work and hours. You look at the house next to yours. Despite being supposedly occupied, it does look very empty. So, you think you see the curtains fluttering slightly. We'll start at 6.30 a.m. When it comes to meals, you'll have breakfast and lunch in the field. But for dinner, feel free to drop by anyone in town's house. They'll be more than happy to put out a plate for you. You bark. The idea of stopping by a stranger's house for dinner seems daunting to you. Ah, don't worry about that. I've told everyone to potentially expect you. Everything should be within comfortable walking distance, so... Won't be difficult. Well, other than the gas station. We don't really have enough for stalling for everyone, so you won't have internet to occupy yourself, unfortunately. So, better get to know other people. She taps her finger on her chin pensively for a second. I think that ought to be the gist of it. It's getting late, so you should head to sleep. Early to bed, early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. With that, she cheerfully heads off, back to her car. You wave at her from the doorway as she drives off to the house she painted out. She pointed out earlier. She wasn't wrong. You really should head to bed. Even though all you did today was sit in a bus, followed by a car for several hours a day, you feel exhausted, physically and mentally. You find the bedroom in your new home, slump into bed, and promptly close your eyes. Day two. You set to work early in the morning. Joseph directs you to cleaning the grain bins. He looks considerably more sober and cleaner than when you last saw him. His face flushes when he sees you, yet again, and he stutters at times as he delivers instructions. The task keeps him fairly focused. The other farmhand, who unsettledly does their best to steer clear of you and Joseph, quietly introduces themselves as... Finn. 
The bins are already empty, but need sweeping on the inside, weeding on the outside and double checking there's nothing remaining from the previous harvest. The work is grueling and after several hours, you successfully finish clearing one bin. The sky is dark by the time you're done and everyone else has already left. You feel your stomach growl. Time for dinner. Where would you like to eat today? Let's go to Joseph's. You decide to have dinner with Joseph. His house is the closest by, so you should be able to fill your stomach quickly. He answers the door after a few minutes of knocking. Look at him. It seems as though his sobriety from early in the morning was a temporary state reserved for the working hours. Ugh. What is it? As soon as you catch his eye, he turns bright red and rapidly shuts the door. It seems he wasn't expecting you. Sacred! Hold on! Wait a minute. I... I will be out in a minute. You wait outside at his request. The time passes. Just as you contemplate leaving and trying your luck at getting fed elsewhere, he opens the door. Looks like he's cleaned himself up. C come in. He wipes his palms on the front of his shirt nervously. The house entrance leads directly into the living room. The thin yellowing curtains and plush patterned sofas in the room give you the impression that the decor hasn't been updated in quite some time. Perhaps generations, even. He covertly tries to kick a few of the bottles thrown about the room under some furniture, which unsubtly clank into each other as they roll and gestures to an open doorway, leading into a combination kitchen slash dining room. The dining room is similarly dated in its styling, with its white cabinets and tile floors. You're about to grab a chair for yourself at the dining table when he quickly rushes to your side. No, wait, let me get that for you. He pulls out the chair for you and waits for you to take a seat. Once you're seated, he quickly serves you a steaming bowl of soup, along with a slice of bread that sits down across from you, watch you expectantly. Oh my god, you don't need to look at me like that, Joseph! The soup's dark yellow color, thick and completely opaque, chunks of vegetables peek out from under the surface. It has the look of a curry, though it smells completely unlike one. Soup au pois. Normally, it's made with ham, but I did not have any. I put leftover meat for protein instead. The moment it passes your lips, you can taste the distinctive earthy flavor of peas, salt, and a hint of thyme. The soup is creamy in texture, with little chunks of potato and carrot, occasional bits of meat adding variety to the texture. It warms you up from the inside, re-energizing you after a hard day of work. It's good. It's really good. He smiles, looking relaxed. I am glad. I was not expecting you to show up, so I didn't have anything fancy prepared. Just some leftover soup I froze from a previous batch. Come for dinner tomorrow, and I will make something fresh. Sharing a meal together seems to ease Joseph's nerves, and he begins to talk more openly about himself. I am a second-generation wheat farmer, I believe. This did used to be a barley farm, but not so much demand for barley anymore. His voice slurs a bit. Disappointing, since barley is easier to grow up here, being more frost-resistant and all. I can't say I'm passionate about the job, but the farm is all I have from my family and my old life. I did used to love this town, so... He blushes. Sorry, I am talking way too much. It's just so nice talking to you. It really feels just like before. But what would you like to talk about? Huh. Sports, TV, the town, you. I want to talk about Joseph. I feel like you already know everything about me. But if you want to learn more, have dinner with me tomorrow. Tell me about yourself instead. Once you finish eating, he clears your plates for you and follows you to the front door. Thank you for coming. He looks at you intensely with an expression as though he wants you to stay or he has something else to say. When he doesn't say anything for a minute or so, you thank him for dinner and say your goodbyes. Heading out the door. Wait! I... He suddenly grabs your arm. I feel something talking to you. I know it sounds crazy, but it feels like I know you already. Like I have known you my whole life. Is 
Isn't it crazy to feel like you know someone so intimately after so little time? Joseph laughs nervously. Then again, crazier things have happened to me. As though realizing the depth of the confession he's just made to you after knowing you less than a day, he lets go of your arms, panicking. His hands grip at the hem at the front of his shirt. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm scaring you. I am such an idiot. You just remind me of... You're so beautiful. Just like... Never mind. He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath, his body relaxing unnaturally quickly, almost eerily, with his hands returning to his sides. He smiles at you brightly, but you feel like there's a hint of panic in his eyes still. Please, come back tomorrow. Please? The desperation on his face lingers in your mind as you drift off to sleep. Day 3 You spend the next day cleaning out another grain bin with Finn and Joseph. Also, repetition has made the job easier. Your body is sore from the previous day, and your aching muscles protest the hard work. After a quick lunch, your two companions head off to the fields, leaving you to finish up the rest of the grain bin. When you step outside the bins to clear some weeds, you see Joseph driving a combine in the fields a good distance away. Finn dutifully riding a tractor alongside him, hauling a large metal trolley for the combine to spit up grain into. The chance moments when you look through the fields, you and Joseph's eyes meet. His gaze is so intense, you feel like you have to look away to avoid it. But you can still feel his eyes on you. After some time, Finn brings the tractor and trolley back over to the grain bins, gradually filling yesterday's freshly cleaned bin with the fresh grain with some sort of mechanical metal tube. By evening time, the fields are empty, and so is your stomach. Where would you like to eat today? We literally only have one choice. Well, only in this version of the game. This is still an early build of the game, specifically released for Nano Reno, as well as the Stained Red Yonder Game Jam. Uh, later on this year, they are planning on releasing more routes, so I believe we should be able to actually visit some of the other, like, um, residents of this town. But let's go see Joseph in the meantime. You find yourself at Joseph's front porch yet again. After his confession last time, you're not too sure what to expect, but the look in his eyes as you left, something about it drew you back to him. Or maybe it was just the memory of that delicious pea soup. You get one knock on the door before it swings open. He must have been expecting you. He's already cleaned himself up after work. The sweat and dirt from the field have been wiped off. It even looks like he cleaned up the living room as well. You're back. I was really hoping you would be. Come in. You follow him back into the combination kitchen dining room, where you're immediately hit with the rich, meaty smell of gravy. Sit down. Sit down. You must be hungry. He pulls out your seat for you again and sets off to make fill both your plates before taking his own seat. I told you I would make something fresh today. I really think this will be your favorite. Today's plate is filled with meatballs and mashed potato, covered in a thick caramel-colored gravy. When you take a bite into the meatballs, they are tender and juicy. It's spiced and zesty in a way that cuts through the heaviness of the meat. There's cinnamon, cloves, and mustard powder in it. Maybe that's what you're tasting. The gravy and mash is smooth and delicious as well. It's ragout de boulette, meatball stew. What do you think? Is it your favorite dish? Yes? He leans forward across the table, waiting for your response. Absolutely! He looks ecstatic, his eyes glassy as though he's tearing up from joy. I knew it! This is such a relief! I just knew you would love it. He smiles at you, looking pleased with himself. Me cooking might seem new, but I have been doing it for some time now. Ever since I lost my parents. I have had a lot of time to practice the recipes in my family recipe book. And, well, it has been really nice eating these meals with you. I have been alone for so long. Eating with you again, it feels like I'm at the table with family. He gets up and begins clearing the table, uh, chatting with you as he tidies up. 
I am really glad you got to try my cooking. I know you always like this when my mother made this before. Dixie. Dixie. What is he talking about? He blanches. Sorry, sorry. You are. Dixie is. He's sweating, fiddling nervously with the front of his shirt, which seems to be a nervous tick of his. He can't seem to meet his. He can't seem to meet your eyes. Dixie, is that you? Isn't it? You look different now, and maybe you don't remember, but your eyes, even the way you speak, the rhythm of your voice. You're. You're so much like her. I've never felt th this way about anyone but you before. So it has to be you. Joseph lets out a heavy sigh. Maybe it's difficult to remember how much I failed you. I never wanted you to see me like this, but after I lost you, after I lost my family, he looks on the verge of tears. Maybe you should go. Please, don't. Please say you will be back. Please. I love you. But you head out the door anyway, feeling as though tomorrow will be an awkward work day. <laughs> oh my god, day four. <laughs> you wake up in the morning feeling as though work will somewhat complicate. Will be somewhat complicated by your dinner with Joseph last night. He avoids you throughout the day, seemingly distracted. Seemingly distracting himself with his work. You watch Joseph and Finn continue the same routine as the other day, out in the fields, making practice turns through the remaining wheat, occasionally returns to the grain bins to offload the harvest. You're left alone to take stock of inventory. How much fuel, fertilizer, seeds are left remaining for post-harvest. Having had two days of physical work, you're thankful for the lack of movement required for this assignment. But the peeling blisters on your heels up to two days of continuous movement make even standing a struggle. Still, looking at the same objects over the course of a day does cause them to blur together. You find yourself physically renewed, but mentally tired after today. Where would you like to eat today? I have no other choice! I'll eat with Joseph! You feel as though you ought to visit Joseph again and clear the air after the previous night. You feel some unease as you knock on the door. You wait outside for a moment when you hear the door unlatch. Oh my god, he's drunk again! <laughs> Joseph peeks outside. He looks disheveled and his eyes are red, as though he's been crying or drinking. Or both. But when he sees you, his face lights up. He rushes towards you, scooping you into a hug. You came back! You remember! You love me. You ask Joseph to hold on. You push him back off you slightly, forcing him to take a step back. Please, call me Jody, just like before. He grabs both your wrists tightly. They feel hot and slick with sweat. Ah, uh, ask Jody to stop? He looks delighted. Dixie, lion, whatever you call yourself now, no matter who you are, I love you. I love you. I love you. You suddenly feel yourself lurch forward as he jerkily pulls you towards him. You feel your mouth collide hard against his as his hands detach from your wrists, one snaking to the small of your back, the other to grip the base of your head. D Joseph, what the hell? Hello? I mean, Jody! Jody, what the hell? He mashes his mouth against you clumsily. Your teeth clack together unpleasantly from the sloppiness of his kiss. The scent of alcohol on his breath leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. It feels like he's doing all he can to be as close to you as he physically can. As though he is trying to climb inside your mouth. Uh, uh, um, um, I kiss him back? Giving into the situation, you find yourself kissing him back. Your, your more controlled pacing seems to slow him down to ground him. His hand, which had been roughly clutching the nape of your neck before, relaxes into a gentle caress. The occasional caress of your back tickles you and sends pleasant shivers down your spine. I'm so happy. His voice is muffled against your lips, breathless and almost inaudible. Still, you can feel a smile on his lips as he kisses you. I'm so happy. You're mine. As you continue to kiss, you occasionally feel his muffled breath against you 
as he mutters to himself, only occasionally are you able to catch what he's saying. When you finally part, he puts his forehead against yours. His eyes are large and full of adoration. I will make sure we have the life we were always meant to have. I promise. He takes your hand and leads you inside. Day five. You wake up in the morning disoriented by the unfamiliar room. Even more unfamiliar than the room you had been boarding in the last few days. Jody's room. In the light of the day, the details that were obscured the night before become clearer. His walls and shelves look like a museum of his youth. What looked to be high school sports trophies, memorabilia, black and white photos of when he was younger. The smell of eggs waft into the room, causing your stomach to growl. You follow the scent into the now familiar kitchen slash dining room. Jody is by the stove. He chipperly flips a frying pan over a wide plate, depositing in it a pancake-shaped omelette. Salute, mon coeur. I made you an omelette au patate. It is my grandma's recipe, so I hope you like it. He cuts you a slice and sits across from you. Also, I am so sorry to everyone who is hearing my failed attempt at a French accent and speaking in French. I don't know how to speak French, okay? Like, this is the best I can do. God damn. It tastes something like a crustless quiche. Also, the taste is much eggier and less creamy, seemingly not having beaten with any milk. But you do get a nice buttery aftertaste to it. The potatoes and onions inside have been browned prior to the eggs being added in, and add a bit of a caramelized taste. Joseph smiles as he watches you enjoy your breakfast. I'll teach you some recipes. It would be nice if you made me food too, but I don't mind cooking for now. I'll even prepare something special when you come over again tonight. When you're done eating together, Joseph clears up your plates and you head out to work together. You're set about to clean the combine harvester. Multiple unexpectedly small doors within the big machine are pried open. You're handed a leaf blower and instructed to blow away any visible seeds or wheat stems from the head. In between the edges of the machine, where bits of wheat are wedged, you're instructed to scrape them out with the flat end of a screwdriver. Jody stands by your side, instructing you step by step. He takes every opportunity he can to take your hand in his to guide you. You can't feel the warmth of his skin through your protective gear, but his proximity heats you up from the inside. Finn stands on top of the combine at the same time, using another leaf blower to clean from the top of the machine. You progressively move from the head of the machine to the back, blowing out bits of plant debris as you go. You finish off with a vacuum of the machine and leave work for the day. Where would you like to eat today? Joseph's! Before you're even able to knock on the door, Jody opens it for you. He's giddy as he leads you to the living room. I was thinking today... We could take a walk down memory lane and recreate our first date. So, to that end, I went and got this out of the closet. He gestures, quite excitedly, at a dress laying on the couch. The dress, much like the furniture it rests on, is dated in style. Even if you were the sort of person in who enjoyed wearing dresses, you're not sure this one would be comfortable at all. It is your favorite dress! You can even wear it on a date. He clearly expects you to be as excited as he is. Um, um, I wear the dress? Sure. Really? I am so pleased. I know this is corny, but I, I think I need this to remember a more pleasant time together. Yeah? Okay, I have a few more things to get ready. You can get dressed in my bedroom and I'll meet you outside. In the privacy of Jody's bedroom, you try on the dress. It hangs unflatteringly loose in some places and pinches in others. It smells distinctly of mothballs. But Jody seemed so happy about it. It's a simple gesture. It's dark when you finally head out. The light from the porch and the nearly full moon help to illuminate the quaint little picnic Jody had set up nearby. He's nervously waiting for you with a crude-looking wildflower bouquet, which he hands to you before taking her hand to guide you onto the picnic blanket. The meal is simple, just some ham and cheese sandwiches and chips, something you imagine he found easy to make before he learned how to cook. 
what do you think? He stares at you completely unblinking, waiting for a response. Uh, what do I think? My thoughts? Um, I'm gonna cream all over this blanket! That's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say, this is incredible. You set this up yourself? He still hasn't blinked. This is incredible! You set this up yourself? I'm Why can't I cream on your blanket, Jody? Are you telling me that I'm not good enough to cream on your blanket? Is that what you're saying? Time feels like it slows down when you utter those words. You feel unnatural and robotic. Wait, they feel unnatural and robotic coming out of your mouth. You feel some apprehension as he continues staring at you, appraising your performance. It feels like minutes have passed when he finally smiles. That is great. It really brings me back. He hands you your plate. Eat this. He commands you. You silently chew your food. The bread tastes stale. The ratio of ham and cheese is off. I've always loved you, you know? Since we were little, I have just met you, my dude! He scoots himself over a few inches until he's right beside you. You chew your sandwich a little faster now. You remember when we were kids? I asked you to come see if the barn cat had kittens. It was just you and me in the loft. We watched the sun setting through the hay loft door and you kissed me. I don't think... I had eyes for anyone else since then. Maybe I never had eyes for anyone but you at all. His words are obviously meant for someone else. Shared memories that you can't recall, but for a moment, you pretend he's speaking about you in earnest. It feels nice to be loved. Dixie, I know things are difficult at home for you right now, with your parents fighting. But I'll be good to you. I promise I will be good to you. We'll never fight. We'll have a picture-perfect family. He takes the empty plate from your hands and places it on the picnic blanket. He moves one of your hands to his chest as he leans in to kiss you. L legit, my guy, how much have you been drinking lately? Because I, I feel like the alcohol has really gotten to your head. Hi, my guy. You believe me, don't you? You stay out with him listening to him reminisce and watching the stars shine in the unpolluted sky. Your only awareness that you've fallen asleep is later in the night when you feel yourself getting picked up and tucked into bed. Day 6 When you arrive to work, you're told today will likely be the last day of harvest for now. You'll be able to have the day off tomorrow. But before then, you'll have to help prepare the field for the next harvest. You ask if you need to clean up all the debris in the field. He smiles brightly at you, clearly excited that you've asked. Jody tells you that you usually leave it there, that it provides cover for soil erosion as well as nutrients for the next planting. The answer is a bit over your head. You're sure it'll eventually come to you the more time you spend working. Soon enough, the last task of the harvest season is complete. Where would you like to eat today? Well, who else but Jody's? Jody greets you at the door, as usual, although he looks preoccupied. Much as I wish it, I do not have time to spend with you today. Last day of harvest and all. I have to talk to Doris about some important business today, but I will see you tomorrow. He steps out onto the porch, closing the door behind him. Then he leans over, kisses you on the cheek before hopping off the porch steps onto the driveway. He pauses a few steps away before doubling back and planting a quick kiss on your lips. For courage. I am a bit nervous about... How this will all turn out, but I won't be a coward this time. With that, you watch as he strides off in the direction of Doris's house. Looks like you'll be spending the evening alone. Day 7. Harvest season is complete. For the first time in almost a week, you wake up after the sun has risen. Today, you finally have enough time to spend the whole day with someone. You think carefully about who you'd like to spend it with. After all, this feels like a big moment to set the stage for the rest of your life in this small town. Who do you want to spend the day with? Eh, let's spend time with Jody. Jody waits for you in the field, a smile on his face. Great work in the last few days. It has been a successful harvest, I think. But we should get you started on learning how to drive a tractor. After all, you're going to be here a long time. A few months pass from when you first arrived. You hear the door creak open, announcing Jody's re return to his house. 
Salut, mon coeur. I am back. Your voice sounds unnaturally high-pitched and cheerful when you greet him. When did you become so pliant? You hear his heavy footsteps enter the kitchen. What did you make? He walks over to the stove you're working over. Grabbing your waist, he moves you to the side and looks into the pot. Your hands begin to tremble as he evaluates your latest meal. It looks good. You did a good job this time. A good job deserves a good reward. What do you think? He pulls your body in front of him, his chest pressed against your back, causing you to sweat from nerves or the shared heat between you. He kisses your neck before whispering into your ear. I have been thinking. We should start a family. His palm presses against your stomach, around where a womb might be. You feel acutely aware of the pressure of his hand against your stomach. Well, it's the way things have been going. It is only a matter of time till you'll be carrying my chest. Lion and Prague, hello? It'll be nice to hear children's voices in the town again. His arms around you feel constricting, possessive. You'll give me that, won't you? My good little wife. To you. Did this original novel literally just end with Lion M. Preg? I am so sorry. Hello. How? How, does, how is this possible? Jody, what the hell? Okay, I want to see what happens if we completely ruin our relationship with uh, Joseph slash Jody. So, yeah. um, Your soup is good, but... Oh. He looks upset, but he's trying to hide it behind a smile. Maybe it tastes different now. I just can't make it as well as my mother did. Me cooking might seem new, but I haven't been doing it for some time now. Okay, okay. Like, you're gonna talk about, like, how, like, cooking means so much to you, but we're gonna skip ahead. Yeah, so instead of asking Jody to stop, ask Joseph to stop. He looks pained, his grip tightening around your wrist. Please. Please. Call me Jody. Please. His hands continue to tighten around you, tightening and tightening as his expression looks more and more desperate. You feel as though he might snap your wrists. So strong is his grip. You call him Jody. You beg him to stop. He loosens his grip. I, I know I do not deserve to ask so much of you, but can you call me that again? You've made me so happy. You suddenly, you suddenly feel yourself lurch forward as he jerkily pulls you towards him, and then he kisses us, and then we push him away. You struggle against his desperate hands and hungry mouth. Mustering all of your strength, you push him off you sharply. Um, he staggers back and falls to the floor, the alcohol affecting his balance. He looks up at you. He seems small and weak, slumped to the floor. I should have expected you to be mad at me after I failed to protect you. I am weak. I am... I am weak. I do not deserve your love. Tears begin to stream down his blotchy cheeks. His body judders as sobs overtake him. You take a step back in an attempt to exit from the uncomfortable situation, but he grabs at one of you desperately, keeping you anchored to the porch. Please! Please! I don't care if you are cruel to me. I don't care if you hurt me. I deserve it. I just... I just want to be with you. Don't leave me again, Dixie! Ah, okay, I'm gonna make another save here. I ain't Dixie, my dude! You tell him you aren't Dixie. His tears stop abruptly. Joseph lets out a nervous laugh, as though you just told him an uncomfortable joke, but he's not smiling. What? That's not true. You tell him again. You're not Dixie! That's not true! His eyes grow large in panic, like a trapped animal. He desperately clings to your legs. You can feel his fingernails digging into your skin. Please, say it ain't true. He begins to claw his way up your legs, up your torso, his entire weight trying to pull you down to his level. The weight of his body eventually topples you over backwards. You feel weightless as you fall backwards. Then a sharp crack at the base of your neck makes impact with the edge of the port steps. There are stars in your eyes for a brief moment and then complete darkness. You can't see anything. You can't feel anything. The only thing you do is hear Joseph's voice calling out to you. Dixie? Monka? Lion? 
No. No, no, no. Kaliste, what have I done? I... I am sorry. I... I can fix this. I can fix this. People can come back from the dead. I've seen it happen before. I just... I just need to talk to Duh. You don't... <laughs> The end. All right, all right. Uh, what happens if we kick him off instead? You draw your free leg back and slam it into Joseph's stomach. His arm quickly wraps around his midsection protectively, and he curls into a ball. <laughs> He's so pathetic! Oh my god! He begins heaving from the shock of the impact, makes with his own inebriation, and chunky vomit hurls from his mouth to the floor. Oh no! You quickly make your escape, leaving him sobbing and lying in a pool of his own throw-up. Yes, tonight you'll have to subside on leftover snacks from your accommodation's pantry for dinner. Maybe some KD. Day 5. When you wake up, you feel on edge as you remember the previous night. You're not sure you really want to go to work today and run into Joseph? The awkwardness of that potential encounter has you feeling nervous. Ooh. Oh, this is a decision. Wait, hang on, hang on. Uh, I'm gonna go... I'm gonna go to work either way. Decide to go anyway. Unfortunately, you did agree to do a job, and you aren't gonna let Joseph's inappropriate behavior stop you from making money. Besides, he was drunk. You could probably put this behind you. You think. You hope, at least. You're set about to clean the combine harvester. Let's skip ahead. Jody does his best to stay out of your way leaving Finn alone to train you. When you do happen to see Jody, he looks terrible, like he's been crying all night. Finn stands on top of the combine at the same time, using another leaf blower to clean from top of the machine. Then we skip, uh, where are going to Joseph, skip ahead. Oh, despite your better judgment, you find yourself knocking on Joseph's door. Maybe you're just looking for an explanation or an apology. Maybe you want paid back, you're not sure. And he opens the door. He doesn't even look surprised. He looks too tired and out of it for that. He leans against the doorframe from support, looking like he'd tip over if you so much as blew on him. You were back. I thought I scared you away with how intense I was being. Well, intense is one word to say that. Like, I think you're looking... I think the word you're looking for is Delulu. Wordlessly, he walks back into the living room, leaving the door open for you to follow. You're alone with Joseph in his house. Think about how to start a conversation with him. There's a heavy silence between the two of you. As you both regard each other, he's fiddling with the front of his shirt again. His go-to nervous tick. Before he can say anything, he begins to speak. His face is in a grimace, as if by frowning enough, he might be able to block out the tears teetering at the edge of his eyes from falling. You probably are wondering what happened, why I have changed so much. You don't know how much he's changed, but you would undoubtedly like an explanation. When I found out what it would cost to bring Abel back, that they would have to kill you. They, that demon, asked me what I wanted to do. In my mind, I wanted to yell at them, to tell them. Osti Kalise bullshit de Krise de Tannerbach. There is no way that that is happening. I'm pretty sure I butchered all of that. I could feel these thoughts running in my head. But when I opened my mouth, I could not say anything. You're lost. You have no idea what he's talking about. But he's too heated to explain himself right now. He's yelling, throwing his arms around wildly all the time. It was like I was watching myself outside of my own body, screaming at myself. Do something. Do anything i should have stopped there i could have stopped everything from happening i am a man i should have he throws a few punches in the air fighting against nothing i am a man i am supposed to be strong i'm supposed to protect you but i just froze like a coward his shouting turns to sobs and he falls to his knees he thought I was going to die. You watch him quietly as he sobs. You aren't sure if you're supposed to comfort him or tell him to snap out of it? If I couldn't have fought for you, I wish I had died with you. 
I wish I had the courage to, to follow you. But I know if I did, I never would have gotten into heaven. Never would have seen you again. The closest to heaven I will ever get is being here with you again. He suddenly throws himself on the ground in front of you, prostrated, heavy with unrelieved guilt. Please, I can't take this anymore. I tried so hard to leave it behind me. Drink till I forget. Punish myself to a ton. But I can never forgive myself. That is why you are here, isn't it? To punish me. There must be why you have been hurting me all this time. Please, please, please. I don't want to feel this way anymore. Please make me feel anything else. Give me a Atonement. Punish me. Uh, I, I, I want to. I really want to. But let me save the game real quick. I'm going to punish him real good. Oh, you're going to get what's coming to you, Jody. Something about him. How pathetic he is. How much he's imposed himself on you. The way he can't even see you as a living, breathing human outside of his own idea of who you are. It pisses you off. So when the opportunity comes, you don't hesitate to grab a fistful of his hair and smash his head into the coffee jail behind him. <laughs> Some bottles that were hidden underneath roll out, jostle from the impact. You turn him around roughly to face you. Blood is leaking out of his nose, painting his smiling lips a beautiful bright red. I will punish him. You kneel down and run your thumb gently down his jaw before pushing your full palm against his chin, drawing your other fist back and smashing it full force against his skull. Almost mechanically, you feel your arm pull back again and smash back into his face again. I will punish him! Again. The blood on his face splatters from the impact. Punish him! Again. His eyes glisten in adoration. Do I? Do I? Punish him some more. Again, you feel a pulse in your hand. You're not sure if it's yours or his. The beat of it seeming to sink with your arm as you thrust Joseph against the ground again. More! Again. You vaguely hear him muttering about how much he loves you. <laughs> he seems out of it. His eyes are unfocused and his speech slid more so than usual. But you're too busy throttling him again to care. More! And again, you grab a fistful of his hair and smash him down hard against the floor. He's no longer moving at this point. In fact, he's no longer breathing. In your over in your overzealousness, you appear to have killed him. Doris is standing by the doorway, looking into the living room where Joseph's limp, bloody corpse lays. You don't know why, but she was the only one you could think of to ask for help in that moment. Oh, Hon. Now, this is just a disaster. But you were right to call me. I can make this all go away. Don't worry about it. She's smiling at you comfortingly, but the circumstances are far too eerie for you to glean any comfort from it. But you know, a community survives on its commas, and without Joseph... I just don't know what we're going to do. Finn alone isn't enough to run this farm. We're going to need your help indefinitely. You do owe it to us, after all. You got a promotion? The end. Huh. Maybe we shouldn't have beat him that hard. Maybe, maybe. That's just that's just what I feel. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Okay, we beat him half to death already. Like... If I hit him one more time, he's gonna die. I'm gonna stop right here. You find yourself kneeling over Joseph's body, breathing heavily. He looks bloody and bruised, but even through the swelling, you can see him smiling. He reaches his hand up to cup your face and pulls you closer, gently enveloping your mouth with a kiss. It's wet and warm and tastes like copper. That's not unpleasant. Ah, uh huh. Well, another choice here. I'm gonna pull away. You pull away from him. He's too weak to protest, even though he looks disappointed. 
You hoist him up over your shoulder and help guide him to the couch. Once he's settled, you wet a paper towel in the kitchen and use it to clean him up as best as you can. He still looks mottled with cuts and raised red skin, but better than before. Day six. Well, we're back at work. Let's skip ahead. His face is a painting of cuts and bruises. You can't help but be distracted by the marks of your effort the other night. Jody tells you that you usually leave it there, but it provides cover for soil erosion as well as nutrients for next planting. Skipping ahead. Finn looks shocked when they first see Joseph's face. You can see their hands tremble as they work. As soon as as soon as they possibly can, they clearly do their best to give you and Joseph a wide berth. Soon enough, the last task of the harvest season is complete. And yeah, let's go visit Joseph. We're gonna skip ahead. Let's see, visit Joseph again. This is day seven, skipping ahead. Joseph had Joseph has been gradually behaving more and more erratically. At times, he seems unable to focus without your comforting acts of violence. Hey, yo! Acts of violence, which leaves him too broken to work the next day, putting more of the workload on yourself and primarily Finn. You make your way to his house one day, only to find his front door open. When you enter, you find him sprawled onto the floor of the living room, blood pooled around his unmoving corpse. There is the sound of running water coming from the kitchen. You slump to the floor next to him, poking him, prodding him, shaking him, anything you can do to wake him up. But he doesn't. His skin is still warm, but there is no life left in that warmth. I thought you'd be swinging by, but you're way earlier than I expected. You quickly turn around to see Lori in the doorway to the kitchen, wiping a hunting knife clean. You do your best to muster some kind of response, a why maybe, but your voice catches in your throat. All you can master is some ineffectual sputtering. Oh yeah, you must be surprised by Jody being dead and all. It's a darn shame. I didn't want to kill him, but he was a right stand-up guy, eh? But he always did say he wished he was dead, so if anything, I did him a favor. It's like how it's cruel to let a dying animal linger. Something along those lines. Still, I feel bad about it, you know? We were friends. At least, I think he was. She starts approaching you, knife still conspicuously in hand. But you? Well, I don't know you from Adam. Before you're even able to react, you feel a sharp tug on your hair that pulls your head back, exposing your neck. You can see Lori towering above you, a smile on her face. Her eyes are large and dark, so dark you can easily see the reflection of your own terrified face in them. You can feel the sharp tip of her knife against your throat. So, I don't have any issues putting you down. Oh! You feel sharp pain and then nothing. The end. <laughs> I kind of love that. Holy frick, that was a pretty cool ending. What? So right now, I'm going to try to get to like, the last ending, which we're missing. And I think for this, like we're supposed to actually like try to get as many affection points of Jody. I don't know what actually like... I don't know what actually, like, triggers it, but I'm just gonna try my best to, like, just butter Jody up. So, yeah, absolutely. Your soup is amazing. Let's skip ahead. Joseph's place. Ask Jody to stop. Okay, skip ahead. Push him away. This isn't necessary, because, like, pushing Jody away, like, um, basically, like, breaks him in a sense and kind of leads you into this, like, abusive relationship between you and Jody. So, yeah, uh, let's skip ahead. Uh... Ooh, do we tell him we're not Dixie? Ooh, wait, 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 no. This leads to a dead end. Kick him off. Just leave. Um, Tricky, tricky. Uh, Just gonna make another save real quick. I think we will just leave for now. You shake your leg free from his grip and walk away. From the porch behind you, you can hear Joseph's wailing sobs. Okay, guess tonight you'll have to subside on leftover snacks from your accommodation's pantry for dinner. Skipping ahead, we're going to work, skip ahead, go to Joseph's. Okay. I don't think this is necessary, but I'm gonna punish him. Just gonna beat him into the ground. Oh my god, and we're just gonna stop. You find yourself kneeling over Joseph's body, breathing heavily. We're gonna skip ahead. I guess we'll kiss him back. We'll kiss him back. This is twisted as hell, but we're gonna kiss him back. You pull away and kiss him tenderly on the parts of his face where you see reddened skin. 
He whimpers, but you can't tell if it's in enjoyment or in pain. Eventually, you pull away from him. He's too weak to protest, despite disappointment. You hoist his arm around your shoulder and have him lead you to his bedroom, where you gently tuck him in. You find a clean towel and take the time to wipe the blood on his face up as best as you can. Before you can leave again to put away the towel, you hear Jody's voice, quiet and feeble. Wait, please, don't go. You set aside the bloody towel on the bedside table and hold his hand. He tucks your hand lightly, invites you into bed with him. Day 6 When you arrive to work, your told today will likely be the last day of harvest for now, and we're gonna skip ahead, go to Joseph, skip ahead, Joseph's again, this is day 7. Your comfort around the farm increases. You learn new tasks every day, how to fix and maintain equipment, driving tractors and combines, spraying pesticide. You aren't an expert by any means, but you feel yourself becoming more and more useful. Finn left town a few days after the last harvest, leaving just you and Joseph to maintain the farm. And that means you spend more time with Joseph than ever, continuing to, glo continuing to grow closer as you work together and share meals together. He says it one evening, while you're enjoying each other's company, his voice raspy from the pressure of your hands around his throat. Hey, yo! Lion, I know you're not her. It takes you by surprise. You can't help but loosen your grip on his neck. I am sorry it took so long for me to tell you. And I realized I felt ashamed. The, the things you do for me, Dixie would have never done in her life. I should have realized sooner. It's been what? 30 years? 40? I have been deluding myself. He takes her hand in his and kisses it tenderly. Despite all his tenderness, his expression is completely unreadable. But, you know, I am glad to have met you. I've turned you into a monster, just like me. When we die, we will be together in hell. I love you, lion. <laughs> oh my god, that was the ending? Jesus, that's twisted one in the world. Anyway, that was a place to grow. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys do want to play this for yourselves, link to the game will be in the description below. This game was oddly fun in a very twisted way. Never in my life would I have thought that I would get the chance to beat the ever-loving crap out of a yandere. Like in other games, okay? Like it is a rare opportunity for catharsis, okay? Like every now and then you get a game which allows you to like, you know, get your comeuppance against like the antagonist. But here, it's actually necessary for a good-ish ending. I am quite surprised about that. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you all have a lovely rest of the day. And as always, I'll be seeing you in the next video. This is Lion, signing off. Ciao.